The question of the day, obviously, you can figure this out by this point in the service, is exactly this question. How do you and I respond when someone hurts us, rejects us? How do we respond when someone disappoints us deeply? Well, perhaps we can respond to life's hurts and disappointments and rejections like Miss Havisham. Miss Havisham is a star character in Charles Dickens' famous novel called Great Expectations. Maybe you're aware of that. Miss Havisham in Great Expectations is all dressed out for her wedding day. She's got the wedding cake, she's got her brand new wedding dress on, and she's ready for the day of her life. But what happens? Her fiancé doesn't show up. Miss Havisham is jilted and rejected by her fiancé. So what does she do? You may remember this from Great Expectations. Miss Havisham closes all the blinds in her mansion. It's going to get really dark. She stops all the clocks so she can forever remember this day and this specific time. She lets the wedding cake stay there and get crusty and corrody and full of cobwebs. And Miss Havisham refuses to take off that wedding dress and lets it hang in yellow decay year after year. All this happened when she was a young lady. Years later, this is what Miss Havisham looks like. There's the crusty, corroded, and cobwebbed wedding cake. Uh, there's the wedding dress. And don't you just love the black lipstick for effect? Miss Havisham has chosen to nurse the hurt, rehearse the hurt. Miss Havisham decides to live in perpetual dismay from this time forward. Talk about living in the past. Is there a better way to handle rejection and hurt and relational pain? You bet there is. That's God's gift to us today from our reading in Colossians chapter 4. The key people here would be Paul and a man named Mark. And Mark hurt Paul deeply. In the time of Paul's crisis, Mark walked out, rejected Paul. Did Paul nurse the hurt? Was Paul like Miss Havisham? Did Paul live in perpetual dismay? Paul says, no way. Paul worked for Christ-centered reconciliation. Did it work? You be the judge. This is from our second reading, Colossians chapter 4, verse 10. Paul writes, My fellow prisoner Aristarchus sends you, these Christians in Colossae, his greetings. As does Mark. Mark. Mark's with Paul. Again, when Paul is in prison, as this sermon unfolds, you need to understand, though, that these words I've placed in bold are critical for what follows. Mark has a cousin, and a cousin's name is one Barnabas. Uh, Paul goes on, speaking to these Colossians about Mark, you've received instructions about him. If he comes to you, welcome him. Let's unpack this verse and see what it has to teach us about Christ-centered reconciliation, forgiveness, harmony, living in peace. This, therefore, is a sermon about Christ-centered reconciliation between a man called Saul, also called Paul, and a man named John, also called Mark. Well, if we're really going to understand this Christ-centered reconciliation, we need a little framework for this, don't we? So let's move to that in our sermon outline. The framework. How did 
Paul and Mark get together, and what was the great discord and disunity in their lives? Well, the mark that we're talking about would be the mark of the gospel of Mark, right? This is Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. This is no ordinary Mark. This is the author of the second gospel in the New Testament, that Mark. What do we know about this Mark? We know a whole lot about this Mark. Luke, who wrote his gospel called Luke, as well as the book of Acts, tells us that Mark's mother's home was used as a meeting place for early Christians in Jerusalem. That's a very prominent Christian family Mark is a member of. Mark's mother's name is Mary. About half of the women in the New Testament are called what? Uh, Mary. (laughs) But Mark also has another prominent Christian in his family. As I said earlier, and Paul speaks to this in Colossians 4 verse 10, Barnabas, Mark's cousin, was a respected Christian leader. That's what Luke tells us in Acts chapter 4. In fact, in Acts chapter 4, Luke tells us that Barnabas sold a field on the island of Cyprus and gave the money to the early church. Mark is surrounded by dynamic spirit-filled Christians, his mother Mary, his cousin Barnabas. So, As we unpack this framework, we also need to understand that the church in Antioch in modern-day Syria, often called Syrian Antioch, sent out the first three missionaries. Did you know that? A little trivia here, but the first three missionaries in the name of Jesus sent out were who? Paul, Barnabas, and... Mark. Luke tells us that in Acts chapter 13. In the book of Acts, Mark is sometimes called John Mark or just John. Everybody got that? So he goes by different names. Just as sometimes in the book of Acts, he's called Saul or sometimes Paul is called Paul. That's the framework. These three missionaries go out Paul, Barnabas, and Mark, or John Mark, or just John, and they go to the island of Cyprus. And there on the island of Cyprus, the good news of Jesus Christ does a massive work. It converts the governor of the island. And Mark and Paul and Barnabas are overwhelmed at their missionary success. So that's the framework. Paul, Barnabas, and Mark on a mission for Jesus. Well, let's move from the framework to the falling out, the falling out. Luke tells us in Acts 13, 13, from Paphos. So Paphos is the major city on the island of Cyprus, where the missionaries had this great gospel success. So they go from Paphos, Paul and his companions, they sailed, they sailed... (laughs) in the Mediterranean Sea, to Perga in Pamphylia, which is in modern-day southern Turkey. And at Perga in Pamphylia, John, who's called John here, but this is the same Mark or John Mark that we have rehearsed earlier, this John what? He said, sayonara, baby, this party's over. I'm done. He left them and went home to Jerusalem. At the critical time, just when they needed John Mark to launch into the hinterland of modern-day Turkey, John left. So why did he leave? Uh, Well, well, perhaps he, he was homesick, right? He was like a freshman in college. He's ready to go home. I'm going home to Jerusalem. Forget this missionary stuff. Maybe he was scared. Uh, Maybe he just didn't want to continue. What prompted John Mark to leave the missionary team? Oh, I'll tell you what it was. It's pretty simple if you read through Acts chapter 13. Luke tells us in Acts chapter 13 in verses 1, 2, and 7 
that the missionary team consisted of Barnabas and Saul, also called, of course, Paul. So who's in charge? Barnabas is. Three times, three times, Luke tells us that Barnabas is in charge. Barnabas and Saul. But look what happens in verse 13. Now the missionary team consists of who? Paul and his companions. Barnabas isn't even mentioned. Barnabas is out of the picture. And who's in charge now? Paul's in charge. Well, that quite often causes division. A new leader, right? You remember, there's a new high school principal. There's a new math teacher. There's a new next door neighbor. There's a new boss. There's a new someone. And that brings about discord because there's a new philosophy of leadership. Can you imagine when Barnabas was in charge? Acts chapter 4 verse 36 tells us that Barnabas is a nickname. You know, his real name is Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus. But this Joseph is such a giving and forgiving and encouraging Christian that the early church says, you're not going to be called Joseph anymore. We're going to call you Barnabas, and Barnabas means son of encouragement. So Notre Dame killed Texas last night, 38 to 3. Barnabas is the head coach of Texas. What does he say? We'll get them next year back in Austin. We'll win one for the Gipper next year. Team, you know, pick up your spirits. We can do it. That's Barnabas, son of encouragement. That's his leadership style. On the other hand, Paul's leadership style was much more like Donald Trump. If Paul is the head coach of Texas, he's saying, you're all fired. That's it. Sayonara, baby, for you. I'm going to get a whole new team that can really play football in South Bend, Indiana. You guys are done. See, Paul is hard-hitting. To say that Paul is intense is a massive understatement. Paul is passionate. So Mark, especially because his cousin was in charge named Barnabas, Mark says, I'm done. I'm not going to follow the hard-hitting Paul anymore. If I can't have Barnabas in charge, I'm out. Luke tells us what happened several years later in chapter 15 of the book of Acts. Sometime later, Paul said to Barnabas, let us go back and visit the brothers in all the towns where we preach the word of the Lord and see how they're doing. Uh, Let's go back to those places in central Turkey and see how these Christian churches are faring. Barnabas, always the encourager, the son of encouragement, of course he wanted to take John also called Mark. Give the guy a second chance. Paul, on the other hand, Paul, one strike you're out kind of Paul, right, did not think it wise to take him because he had deserted them in Pamphylia in Acts 13, verse 13, and had not continued with them in the work. So you can imagine saying, Paul, this guy's toast. He's done. He's a quitter. He's a deserter. And Barnabas is saying, give the guy a second chance. And so Luke tells us they had such a sharp disagreement that they parted company. Paul's point is, Mark's a deserter. Mark's a quitter. You can't count on Mark. In fact, the early church knew an earlier event, long before Perga in Pamphylia, when Mark caved in, and Mark himself writes about it. Ironically, in his gospel, chapter 14, 51, and 52, a young man, that would be Mark, That's Mark, and he's with Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, the night our Lord was betrayed. So he's just wearing nothing but a linen garment. He's following Jesus on Monday, Thursday. When they seized him, 
So the Romans not only seized Jesus, they seized John Mark. And what does Mark do? Stand up for the rights. Stand up for the Savior. Stand up for the cause. No, Mark deserts his Savior. In fact, he was so scared that he ran away buck naked. Mark is the first Christian streaker in the New Testament. Leaving his garment behind. That's Paul's point. Mark failed Jesus in Gethsemane. Mark failed us in Perga and Pamphylia. Mark's done. Well, you knew this question was coming sooner or later. Who has disappointed you? Who are you ready to write off? Who do you look at and say, one strike and you're out? And maybe it really is your boss or your spouse or an ex-spouse. Maybe it's a child. Teenagers can be difficult. Uh, Maybe it's someone in this church. Maybe it's a next-door neighbor. Our sinful inclination is to do a what? A Miss Havisham again, right? Uh, Maybe we don't close all the blinds, but we live in the dark. Maybe we don't put on black lipstick, but we live in death. Maybe we don't stop all the clocks, but we nurse and rehearse the hurt so it feels like it just happened yesterday. And maybe there isn't cruddy wedding cake and an old wedding gown on, but we know Oh, to a person we know deep inside the pain and the disappointment of someone in our lives. Do we need to live in perpetual dismay? Do we need to stay stuck in the past? No way. That is God's gift to all of us today. There is the framework And there is the falling out, but there is also forgiveness, rich and abundant forgiveness. Paul writes about it. Remember a couple of weeks ago in this sermon series, we looked at Colossians 3.13. Let's look at it again. Paul says, bear with each other and forgive what other grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. Folks, that's easy to write. Folks, this is easy to preach. (laughs) But when push comes to shove and you're in a messy relationship, forgiving as the Lord forgave you is really, really, really hard. Paul isn't willing in Colossians just to talk about forgiveness. Paul not only talks the talk, you know Paul walks the walk. Paul is ready to forgive as Jesus forgave him. And where did Paul get that from? Paul knew the greatest reconciliation narrative in the Old Testament. You know it too, don't you? It was our first reading from Genesis 50. Uh, Remember, Joseph is 17 years old. And he has the coat of many colors. And his brothers despise Joseph. Because Joseph is his father's favorite. The father Jacob loves Joseph more than all the other brothers. So what do they do? They take Joseph, this 17-year-old teenager, throw him into a pit, sell him to some Midianites on their way to Egypt. They say, Joseph's done. We never have to deal with that dude again. (laughs) But you know the story, right? 24 years later, Joseph becomes prime minister of Egypt. He's second in charge. And that's where we pick it up in today's first reading, where the brothers (laughs) now are on the other end of the stick. And what are they saying? I wonder if Joseph will hold a grudge and pay us back 
for all the evil we did to him. And what does Joseph do? Verse 19 in Exodus chapter 50. What a great question. Am I in the place of God? Most of the time you and I say yes. I'm the judge. I'm the jury. You're guilty as charged. End of case. Joseph says, I'm not in the place of God. (laughs) And then in verse 20, Genesis 50, he says, you intended to harm me, but God intended it for good, for the saving of many lives. Joseph saw that there is redemption in rejection. And I'll say that one more time because it's worth preaching about, right? There is redemption in rejection. And then he says in verse 21, that he spoke kindly to them and reassured them. Joseph did not live in perpetual dismay. No way. Joseph forgave and loved and comforted his brothers. And Paul knows it. Paul will also forgive as the Lord forgave him. That's what our text is all about. One more time, Colossians 4, verse 10. Paul says, my fellow prisoner Aristarchus sends you his greetings, as does Mark. That just blows my mind away. That here is Paul at the end of his life in the dark, damp, deadly Mamertine prison in Rome. And who's with him? Mark, of all people. (sighs) Paul goes on, you've received instructions about him. If he comes to you, welcome him. What's up with that? Colossae is very close to Perga in Pamphylia, where 17 years earlier, Mark abandoned the first missionary team. Did these Colossians know about Mark's desertion? You bet they did. Did these Colossians probably hold Mark in some disdain? You bet they did. Did these Colossians know about Mark streaking in the Garden of Gethsemane? You bet they did. And Paul says, listen, if Mark comes from Rome to Colossae, you welcome him. You forgive him just as I have forgiven him. Now, why would finally anyone want to get involved in reconciliation and humble themselves and want to forgive and live in peace and harmony? Why finally did Paul do this? Because Paul knows another member of the early church. Check that. (laughs) Paul knew the member of the early church, the head of the early church, the head of this church. And this member of this church leads by example. Jesus understands that forgiveness is often a messy proposition. In fact, forgiveness could actually kill you. And in this case for Jesus, it did. How messy did it get? Oh, you know the narrative as well as I do. There were nails. There was blood. There was a crown of thorns. And there was rejection, crucifixion, and he's just about ready to get buried. Rather than write us off, the gospel, the best news you will ever hear is that Jesus refuses to write you off. Jesus refuses to hold a grudge. Jesus refuses to bring up our past. All of this was predicted, planned, previewed, and prophesied throughout the Old Testament. This is the way the serpent is crushed. (laughs) predicted in Genesis chapter 3. This is the way the Lamb of God takes away the sin of the world, predicted in Exodus chapter 12. This is the final atonement for all sin, predicted in Leviticus chapter 16. And this is Isaiah's suffering servant, crushed and crucified for you. This Jesus would rather get 
really, really messy and really, really messed up. So he can come to you just here, just now, with real body and real blood and assure you that no matter what, literally, he will never, ever, ever write you off. So don't we get tired of living in the past? I do. I really do. I have so much in common with Miss Havisham in Charles Dickens' novel, Great Expectations. But how's that really working for us? How's it work to don the death clothes and close the blinds and stop the clocks and nurse the hurts and live in the yellowed clothes all the days of our lives. That's not working very good, is it? It's actually killing us. Is there a better way? Do we have to live in perpetual dismay? No way. No way. We can live in Christ-centered reconciliation. Don't believe me? Then just ask two men Two famous men, two Christian men, and how it all worked for them. One man is called Saul, also named Paul. The other man, you know him now, he's called John, also called Mark. They did it. So will we. Let's stand and sing about that, shall we?